What's up? Good evening. Good to see everybody. All right, we're all together, one big family. Good to see you guys. If you're looking for Pastor Mark, he went down to where the hurricane's at. So, you know, he, he's on a much needed vacation. He's north of that, so I'm sure he'll be fine. But uh, we're looking forward to getting back. But until then, he's getting some rest, so we understand that. But tonight, we're going to be in Psalm 22. We're going to take a, a look at what our Lord has done for us. We could label this the view from the cross. In every one of the Gospels, we have eyewitness accounts of what took place at the crucifixion of our Lord 2,000 years ago, if you read through the Gospels. And we have his words recorded as those there around him on that day were led by the Spirit to document what had happened. But Psalm 22 is really the only place that we have what we might call the view from the cross. David, who wrote this psalm, was led by the Spirit to record what would happen on that day through the eyes of the Lord, just like the disciples did through the gospel, but from the outside. The difference being that David wrote this a thousand years before the Lord was crucified. Second Peter tells us that prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by his Holy Spirit. And the life of David has no instances that would cause him to write these things about himself. It makes you wonder what was going through his mind as the Holy Spirit inspired him to write these things. I can't imagine that. To, un to unknowingly describe elements of crucifixion hundreds of years before crucifixion was invented and used in a thousand years to specifically point to the medical condition of even just the ruptured heart that would happen in the Messiah a thousand years later. To write those things, not really understanding what you're writing, but the spirit of prophecy moving through those men. And yet, how much does it build our faith, right? When God shows us the specifics of future events through prophecy, through his prophetic word. The angel tells John in Revelation 19, worship God. He says this, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. If anybody tells you that you don't need to pay attention to prophecy, you take them to that verse. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, what testifies of, of Christ in his ministry are the prophecies spoken of the Messiah. And it's not like the cross was plan B, okay? It's not like the Lord didn't know what to do and now we got to deal with these men and how do we save them? It's not plan B. Revelation tells us that the lamb was slain from what? From the, look at that Calvary people from the foundation of the world. And one last thing to point out before we get started, what we read here, Jesus did so you don't have to. As we look through his eyes, what he viewed on that day 2,000 years ago, he did that so we don't have to. Paul writes in Corinthians 21, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Before we get started, let's pray. Lord, we love you so much, Father. Thank you for this family time, and we're just great worship. Lord, coming together, and we're lifting our hearts and our voices, Father, to you. Lord, all in praise of what you've done. And much of that, Lord, well, we know what it hinges on. It's what we read tonight, what we see tonight, God. Your plan of salvation for us to bring us into your family. Thank you, Lord. Let us have grateful hearts, Lord. As we go through this, Lord, let it be more than just something we're engaging our minds in, but Lord, that it, it rends our hearts, Lord, that it tears our chests open, Father, and searches us out, God, and stirs us up to love more, Father, if we have become stagnant in that. Lord, I know studying it for me, Lord, a confession that it has done that in me. Lord, so many times we go along and just one foot after the other, and Lord, it can become rote, Lord, where we're just doing the actions. But Lord, let us pause tonight and go back, Lord, and, and remember the cross and let it stir up in us, Father, that response and that love because you first loved us. Bless the teaching of your word, Lord. I do ask that you'd be with those in the path of this storm, Lord, especially your children, all who are there, but especially, Lord, those who are yours. Give them wisdom, Father. Watch over them. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> you find this title at the top of Psalm 22, if you look at it, your Bible probably has it. To the chief musician 
set to the deer of the dawn, a psalm of David. Now, any time that you see this, just kind of keep this in the back of your mind, to the chief musician, that means that this was to be sung corporately in worship. This was for the worship leader to have and to be prepared to be able to sing this and lead others in it. No doubt that the Lord intending the Jewish people would memorize and have to wrestle with the truth of the crucified Messiah. Verse 1 says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now in the Gospels we see that Jesus cries out this question from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, and, and don't be confused, right, into thinking that the Lord didn't understand what was going on all of a sudden, that he was caught by surprise or anything like that on the cross, you know, that he had to ask this question. It doesn't come from that place. No, Jesus already knew the answer, but for the first and only time, the first and only time in all of eternity, there was a moment of separation between the Father and his Son. This was new. And inside of that separation, when ha what ha that happened there at the cross, it was the first time that Jesus referred to the Father, notice this, as God. When he cried that from the cross, all the time before that, he said, all through the Gospels, it's my Father, or the Father, or Heavenly Father. That's the way he referenced his Father. But in this moment, it is that more distant reference because of what's happening he says, instead of my father, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do, listen, do I totally understand the Trinity and how it works and how this separation coincided? Absolutely not. I don't. I think I do to a point, so I plant my flag there, and I'm kind of good with resting there until the Lord shows me more, you know, and I'm okay with that. I think we run into those things as we study Scripture, right? And you may be able to move that flag occasionally. Like, I get it a little more now, you know? That's okay. Plant your flag and let it hang there until you can move it again, but... I get it a little bit, but I don't totally understand it. That the doctrine of the Trinity is true, and yet what Isaiah writes in Isaiah 59 is also true. He says there, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. I understand that. I understand the Trinity is true, and I also understand that sin separates from God. If you're in here tonight and you don't know your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, you're a sinner and you're separated from God. If you are a believer knowingly and willfully walking in sin and continuing in that, don't be surprised at the distance and the separation. He's still your father. Repent and run back. But separation comes from sin. And that's what happened to our Lord there on the cross. If you glance down at verse 3 in our passage, you see the reason that God turned his face from the Son in that moment. We read in verse 3, he says this about the Father. He says, but you are holy. God is so pure and so holy that in that moment, for the first time and only time, the Son took on the sin of the world. Because of his love for you and me, the Father had to turn from him. You think about the life of Jesus, fully God and fully man, right? That's a good way to think about it. Having never sinned, always walking in purity and complete fellowship with the Father for all time, and then in a moment taking all of sin for all of mankind. Listen, I know how bad I feel when I sin and just the weight of that. You know what I mean? Just that, you know? Just to know that I made a decision and stepped into something or crossed the line or, you know, that sin I carry, the weight of that. Now take that and multiply that. Multiply all of our sin for all time. Take that in one moment and carry it in a pure vessel like Jesus Christ. Think about what he went through in that moment, the weight of it. Habakkuk 1.13 says, You are of, talking about the Father, you are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. In that moment, Jesus became sin. So the father turned from him. Imagine what the father must be look like to be so pure. And yet first John tells us this also, that not only is he pure, but God is love. God is love. At the same time that Jesus became sin, he was overcoming the power of sin because he loved you. Both in tandem, both working at the same time. And the rest of verse one, if you look back, 
Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Listen, because of crucifixion and becoming sin in a moment, he was groaning. You know, I don't know if you've ever been there. That deep pain, you know, Jesus there had deep pain and separation. But I think, you know, if I've been through it really maybe once or twice, but you're ever caught off guard by just a tragedy that you were not expecting. You know, and all of a sudden, just that moment where that deepness, I mean, you, you can't even explain it, but it, it comes almost from the, your stomach. You know, the pain, you're just sick and you don't understand, you just start crying out to God. And, you know, and that, that's kind of the picture, obviously much heavier with the Lord, but that's the groaning coming from inside him in a moment, calling out to the Father. Verse two, he says, oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, and am not silent. This looks to be a reference really to the three hours of darkness in the middle of the day. You know, if you remember what's in the gospels there, is the Lord gave up his spirit there on the cross and the veil was torn. You know, the Lord, the veil was rent from top to bottom, right? You remember God saying, out of the way, no more law, grace, forgiveness, come to me based on the blood of my son. When all that happened, it turned dark, you know? And so there was this night season in the day Again, in verse three, we have the reason that the father turned away from the son. Verse three, but you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted you in you and were not ashamed. Now, to me, as I read through this psalm, this almost seems a little out of place, you know, because he's, he's crying out and all this, and it's like, boom. You know, he starts talking about the attributes of God the father. Now, what is laid out before us is something that the Lord encouraged himself in while they're on the cross. That even though he was going through this, he recalled these things about his heavenly father. He remembers this, the history of the faithfulness of his heavenly father and also the character of his heavenly father. He says, our fathers trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered and were not ashamed. If Jesus himself recalled the history and faithfulness of the character of his heavenly father in a moment of desperation, let me ask you a question. How much more should we, right? If our Lord did that, he said, Father, I, all of this is going on, the weight, the separation, and what does he do? He reminds himself of the attributes of God. How much more should we? You know, in spite of the changing circumstances surrounding us at any given moment, those attributes of his, they're steadfast and remain the same. As believers, I know we can all look back and see the faithfulness of God in our past, right? You agree? Yes. Amen. We see God's faithfulness. And even those of us, you know, with a little, little faith, even we can kind of get there where we say, you know, I can muster up, well, I know the Lord is going to be there for me tomorrow. I can say that. Amen. Amen. If you're like me, it's not the past or the future, you know, that I have trouble with. It's the moment I'm in right now. You know, that's the one where it seems like I don't know what it is about. Maybe it's just me, but I've heard the same thing from other people. I know God's been good to me. I know, you know, he's going to be good to me tomorrow and take care. Yes, I know that. But it's right now. I just don't like I'm the same way. I get it. It happens every time I get up here to teach. Like God's been faithful every time I taught. I know he's going to be faithful to teach his word, but Lord, if you don't show up, I'm going to throw up, you know? Like that's, that's what I go through. And he's always faithful. So I'm trying to remind myself he's faithful in this moment. You know, we go through, am I really where I'm supposed to be? How's this bill going to get paid? And so on and so on and with the questioning. But, oh yes, God has been faithful. We see the past and I know he will be faithful Jesus is recalling the Father's history and character of faithfulness and letting it be a reminder that in that present moment, in spite of what was going on around him, that God is in control. God is in control. He encouraged himself in the Lord. Even though the storm, it was real, right? The storm was real. The storm can become real in our own lives. The storm was real for him on the inside and on the outside. Look at verse 6. This is interesting. He says, but I am a worm and no man. The Jewish people who read this, they would understand exactly the word that was being used here for worm, uh, tola. And there's really nothing that comes to mind that is lower than a worm. Now, if we think about somebody referencing themselves as a worm, that's about as low as you can get. But this is a specific kind of worm. 
It has very peculiar traits. It has a very distinct way of dying and giving birth. That is the exact word that Jesus used here that, that the psalmist wrote prophetically. When it comes time for the little worm to bring forth its young, it climbs up onto a tree, knowing that it's never going to come down. This is the last action of its life. Its sole purpose in that moment is to bring forth life at the cost of its own life from this point on, when it begins to make that ascent up the tree. And she finds a spot on that tree and she attaches herself there and she begins to glue herself to exude this stuff that begins to attach her to this tree. And then underneath her, when the young are born, she exudes this scarlet red liquid that will feed the young as she dies. She begins to give up her life to begin to bring birth to her young that are underneath her. Her death brings forth life. And the Spirit specifically uses this word by the psalmist to describe the ministry of the Messiah. And just as the time comes for that little scarlet worm, the toll it to give its life to climb up on that tree by God's design, Jesus said this. He said, therefore my Father loves, loves me. Why? Because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me. No one drives the little worm up that he referenced, the specific word he used. He knows that it's time to give birth. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down to myself. I have the power to lay it down again, and I have the power to take it up again. This command I have received from my Father. And many times Jesus just walked away from those desiring to kill him because it wasn't his time. You see that as you read through the Gospels. Then the time comes. And Jesus, by his own will, lays down his life for you and me of his own will by the Father's design. And this little worm, you know, just as it brings forth its young, it dies and gives out this red liquid which the young could feed on. And they're, all, they're also, listen to this, that red liquid doesn't just feed them, it also marks them. That dye that, that their mother puts on them in that moment, it never goes away. They're marked for life from what takes place there. On the night before his crucifixion, Jesus was there with his disciples celebrating the Passover. We read in Luke, it says this, and he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying what? This is my body, which is given for you. Take it and eat it in remembrance of me. Jesus gives us this picture of his love and care to lay down his life so that we can live. Just as the young are born out of Tola, this worm, the, the worm, this, this word that's used here, the church was born out of the death of our Lord. And if you see that stain that comes from the death of this little worm, it's pretty amazing. I mean, I couldn't believe how much red and how vivid. I mean, it literally looks like a blood stain on, this tr on the tree where these are found after they're crushed. It's a reminder of what the cross must have looked like. A scarlet stain looks much like blood soaked into the wood of that tree. By the way, interesting to note, the crushing of this worm is what is used for the scarlet dye in the tabernacle, the specific. I know there was purple that was used with the, the snails, but the red, the scarlet, was, came from this tola worm. And as well, also used in the high priestly garments that were to be scarlet. Isaiah writes this using the word scarlet later. He says, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins are like scarlet. It's the same root word for tola he uses there. They shall be white as snow. Notice that. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Listen to this. After three days, this scarlet worm, after his given its life, it's, it's red for those three days, but then after that, it folds its body into something that really closely can resemble a heart. So now there's this little, there's this blood-stained spot, and then there's this little heart on the tree. It turns white and transforms then into a waxy substance that they harvest from these worms. And that white waxy material is harvested and then used as a preservative. This is the word that the psalmist uses here. Those who have had their sins changed from scarlet to white, we are what? We are preserved, right, by what he has done for us. Then you look at the rest of verse 6. He says, A reproach of men and despised by the people, 
All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Listen, David writing a thousand years earlier of what would be happening on that day to the Messiah, all of the religious leaders who had rejected him, all of the political appointees who wouldn't touch him, and all of the mockers in the crowd, pointing back to the ministry and words of Jesus as they mocked him there on the cross. Matthew records it this way. I'll read it to you. He says, and those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself if you are the son of God. Come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests. This is what the psalmist is, is talking about a thousand years earlier, exactly what happened. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and elders, said, he saved others, himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, that's an interesting way to put it, he saved others. He did, didn't he? If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him. Exactly what was written. Now, if he will have him, for he said, I am the son of God, even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. The psalmist describes this, you know, this kind of shooting out the lip, right? It's a real mocking type of, you know, yeah, whatever, you know, you said, and it's just kind of, you know, all this going on with the Lord hanging there. And he sees this. Verse nine, but you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breasts. I was cast upon you from birth from my mother's womb, you have been my God. You know, and I think the question has been asked and we may have that question. Well, when did Jesus know that he was the Messiah? You know, when did he know that he was the son of God himself? And, I, you know, most of us, we can recall the, the account when Joseph and Mary, they lost him in Jerusalem after they had traveled there for Passover. You guys remember the story. They end up leaving, you know, thinking that little Jesus is in the caravan for quite a few people. And so they, they start looking for him after about a day. And then after three days, they find him. They go all the way back. They find him. There he is in the temple. He's blowing all the teacher's minds, right? Asking questions and teaching them. And, and they say, well, why didn't you leave with us? You know, Jesus, where you been? And Jesus at 12 years old says this. He says that he what? Must be about my father's business, right? So we know at that point that the Lord knew for sure by then. But many scholars also see these verses as a pointing to long before that. That even at the time he was dependent on Mary as a baby, her being his mother, that Jesus knew and understood who he was. They see those verses uh, proclaiming that. Verse 11, be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. And we know scripture says that the shepherd will be struck and the sheep scattered, even Peter, right? And all of his earthly strength as a burly fisherman ready to fight the world in one moment left the Lord to hang on that tree. No flesh involved there. No work of the flesh, only the power of God paying for our sin. And these next few verses are interesting and give us some insight into what was happening in the unseen realm around the cross. It's um, the first time I've studied like through this verse by verse. It was pretty interesting. Verse 12, many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. Now listen, obviously we know, right? There were no bulls, you know, wandering around the cross mocking the Lord, right? So, so you start to look at this, you say, well, what is this? Pretty descriptive. This area of Bashan, you know, should sound familiar from the conquest of Israel as they took the land from the Canaanites. It says this, uh, I think it's in Deuteronomy, but I have it here. It says, for only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the giants. Indeed, his bedstead was an iron bedstead. It says, is it not in Rabbah of the people of Ammon? Nine cubits is its length. So I did the math, it's about 14 feet long. And four cubits its width, according to the standard cubit. Listen, when the children of Israel were going in to take the promised land, remember the first spy said that the people there, they said they're so big, we feel like grasshoppers. You know, we can't go in there. Joshua and Caleb, my men, said, we should by all means go in there. Like, I love that stout heart, you know. But they said, we can't go in there. They're giants. We don't want to deal with that. 
We know from Genesis that, the, that these were the Nephilim, from the Nephilim. They were demonic beings who came into women and produced a race of giants. You know, and there's been plenty of archaeological evidence. Uh, I was listening to a pastor. He has a book that records, um, I think it's from the late 1800s, but, you know, many of the doorways and uh, rooms that they found in this certain area, I guess near Bashan, you know, some of the, the ceilings were like 16 feet. You know, the doorways are like 14 feet, 15 feet. I mean, just unreal. There were subgroups also of the Nephilim. If you read through the Old Testament, you'll see David, you'll see the children of Israel going in, you'll hear these names, the Rephaim, the Anakim, the Zamzuman, the Amim. You see all those, that's what it's talking about. It's talking about that race of giants, this offspring of the demonic coming into the daughters of men. Although the men were killed and wiped out, the spirits that took part in producing this race of giants was not. Now, we know some of them were locked away in Tartarus to be left, let out in the last days. Uh, Pastor Mark does a great study on that. But no doubt with regional demons, you know, as well, you remember uh, in Daniel, the angel references the prince of Persia, right? And we understand that he's talking about demonic spirits. He's talking about principalities and powers over areas. You know, there is a, uh, I'm sure there's a, over Knoxville, you know, these levels of demonic spirits that are allowed to do some of the things we see. In pagan worship, you will find the bull or oxen often as a figurehead of those demonic forces which are behind idol worship. In Ezekiel 1, we read the description of the living beings which were a type of angel. It says, and one of their faces was of an ox. You remember that? And so there seems to be this connection there. These fallen angels seem to carry on this identity, at least one, some class of them, in some way or another with bulls and oxen as a representation. And in this area of Bashan, with the race of dead giants also carried an association to these fallen angels, you know, it makes you wonder what the Lord was seeing in the spiritual realm on that day, doesn't it? You think about everything he's going through and his body racked and, and the weight of sin and all this. And then you think about all the people mocking and jeering at him while he's going through that and the shame of it. But then you think about what's standing behind them to see those dark forces. You know, that's what he's describing here. The demonic forces, you know, and describes them as bulls. Bulls represent strength. Greater is heathens in me than the heathens in the world. They thought something was going on, but really there's a whole different thing going on. Verse 12 says, many bulls have surrounded me. So we have a strong breed of huge demons there around our Lord, mocking and jeering. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths. You know, some kind of large horned, strong demonic forces mocking and making a showing with their mouths at the Lord in that moment. Like a raging and roaring lion, he says. You know, regular bulls, they don't roar like a lion. But those who follow Satan do. It makes you wonder how much knowledge the Lord kept from them concerning what was taking place that day, doesn't it? I think about because they're thinking that they're winning at this moment. Since Jesus' birth, Satan had been trying to kill him. I think he knew that something was different. Someone's here, and this is a problem. You remember that Herod had all the baby boys in the area under two killed, right? Trying to wipe him out, trying to annihilate him. And now around the cross, thinking they have won, mocking, bringing the Son of God to an end. All I can say is you should have read Genesis, right? You will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head, snake. That's what's going to happen on that day. Verse 14, he says, I am poured out like water, going on and describing crucifixion here long before crucifixion was invented. I am poured out like water. And all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. You remember the Jews requested that Jesus' legs to be broken. If you look at the crucifixion accounts uh, through the Gospels, like the others, they had broken the legs of the thieves so that they, he couldn't carry the weight of his body. That's what they requested. That's what they did to the other guys. But as the Roman soldiers came to him, he had already given up his spirit. We see that there. And so to make sure, you remember the soldier does what? 
He takes the tip of that spear and goes up under his ribs and slides it up into his heart. And what comes from his side? Blood and water, right? As he would hang there on that cross, part of the agony was having to raise himself up. You can imagine, you know, the weight of the nails and then through the feet and having to, after the beating all night, having to, to you know, when you hang like this, I don't know, I, I go to the gym and there's this new thing they do where they just hang there. I'm like, hmm, that looks interesting. So I went over and I tried it. You can't make it very long, really. I mean, it's pretty amazing, you know. I can't imagine with nails through your hands having to, to pull up and try to get your lungs to open up enough to get breath. And all the stress, you think about the beating from the night before, along with the stress across his heart by the tightness and the, you know, the muscle failure beginning to happen in all of his joints and all of his ligaments. And that fluid then begins to build up around your heart. He said, my heart is like wax. It has melted within me. As a soldier pierced his heart, blood and water, there are the fluids of birth came out. He said, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. We know that none were broken as was commanded of any sacrifice in the Old Testament. You weren't to break their bones. He was the one in perfect sacrifice, perfect spotless lamb. He had been examined. Now he was there. And according to the word, he could not have his bones broken. So guess what? He gave up his spirit before they got to his knees because he wasn't going to let the word of God fail. So no bones were broken. But the weight and atrophy of the muscles on the joints as he hung there began to fail. He said, all my bones are out of joint. The ability to raise and get a breath, that began to diminish. It became harder and harder. He says in verse 15, my strength is dried up like a potsherd. He gives this picture of a broken piece of pottery in the desert sun. You, know, you think about that, how dry that is. Laying there, he gives this picture of that broken piece of pottery because he was, he's so dehydrated from the sweat and the physical exertion by this point. All of his body fluid, bodily fluids are gone. He said, and my tongue clings to my jaws. If you remember at one point, they tried to give him a mixture of painkiller and vinegar. You know, we don't really know what the painkiller was. Uh, some say myrrh, but, and what did he do? He rejected it the first time, right? He turned it away because he was determined to fulfill what he was there to do without lessening the pain. He didn't want to take the easy way out. He wanted to fulfill what the father had required of him and what they had set out to do. That later they offer him straight vinegar. If you remember, you got to read all the Gospels to get the whole picture. They offer it the first time, he rejects it. And then later they offer him straight vinegar, and, you know, and, he, and he lets them touch it to his lips. But it's just enough to just wet his mouth, enough to say, to tell us die, loudly, to proclaim that, to tell us die. It is finished, very clearly from the cross. Earlier when he said from the cross, we read it the first part of this psalm, but then when you read in the Gospels, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. His mouth had been so dry at that point. And that's what he talks about, his tongue clinging to his jaws. You know, his tongue swollen. That when he tried to get the words out, it just, all they could hear was Eli, Eli. You know, they didn't, it's like, yeah, yeah, you know, and, and they're saying, what is he saying? I don't know. I think he's calling for Elijah, right? You remember that? His tongue was so swollen and dry from dehydration. That's what David writes about. He says, you have brought me to the dust of death. And that is what happens to our bodies, Right? From dust you came and the dust you shall return, but not our soul. Death is described as the separating of our soul from our body. Mind, emotions, and wills, you know, uh, everything within this system shuts down. But we know that that system continues. The only way that true life is found is then for our spirit to become alive, that we would receive Christ into our hearts. And then there's a part of us awakened that has never been alive but for Jesus, for his body, that it was going to the dust of death. He says, you have brought me to the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. 
the congregation of the wicked wicked has enclosed me. Listen, not only were the, the Jews and the Romans there, but the Gentiles as well. And this word for dogs is what the Jewish really, that, what they would have used, you know, uh, same word here. And so he says, the dogs have surrounded me. Earlier, he mentioned that, all, that they were all there. You know, and, and I'll tell you this, uh, we were all there. It was my sin that put him there. My sin. You know, I don't really understand. That's one of those things I've planted my flag so far, and I don't know if I can take it much further right now, but it kind of, you know, when you think about that and you think about what he went through, to me it provokes, uh, I don't want to add to that. You know? I know I'm not perfect. I know I'm not going to be perfect in this life, but I don't want to add to that. I know it's one and done. He's taking care of all that. But in some way, in my mind, I feel like, you know, trampling on that. Hebrews talks about that. Going back and trampling on that blood like it's nothing and what he's done for me. To have that heart and mindset, that's not right. I'm thankful for his grace. I'm thankful that he's forgiven me for the way I'm going to mess up tomorrow. But I shouldn't live in a way that I'm flippant about the cross. And I think many of us, you know, I know for me, I'll speak, I'll speak for myself. We get, we get in churchianity, you know, and we just put one foot after the other and we start doing all these things. And sometimes it becomes just an intellectual, you know, trip. And, and I get it. We have all these chapters through our lives. But I think that this is something that we have to be willing to always come back to and remember to not forget what our Lord has done for us. We were all there. He says, they pierced my hands and my feet. Listen, the Jews have had a hard time wrestling away this scripture. When were David's hands and feet pierced? They weren't, right? But he wrote this. Hundreds of years before crucifixion, a thousand years before Jesus hung on the cross, David writes this. And then Zechariah later before Christ also, but he writes this prophetic word speaking about Jesus' return and second coming. Zechariah says this, he says, talking about the Lord, speaking from the Lord, I will pour out on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace, not law, the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. When was he pierced? They have a hard time with that. When was he pierced? When was the Lord pierced? It says, yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Interesting that John saw Jesus in Revelation as a lamb who had been slain, right? As he turns and sees him, he says, I saw him as a lamb that had been slain. You know, it sounds like to me, I don't know how long this is going to last when we get there, but from that appearance, from what John describes, that the only man-made thing that we're going to find in heaven are the marks that man made on the Lord's body. That's the only man-made thing we're going to see. Oh, what a reminder. And I think about, you know, scriptures indicates that he's going to be serving. You think about sitting around the table, enjoying what he's done for us. And I don't know, just seeing that hand pass in front of you, you know, or rest on your shoulder. Verse 17 says, I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. This is a reference to the Lord's body just being stretched, you know, that tightness as his bones begin to protrude from his skin. Verse 18, it says, they divide my garments among them. Notice that. And for my clothing, they cast lots. How specific. The gospel records a scene of the Roman soldiers there as Jesus is on the cross taking his tunic, which was made of one piece, and gambling for it so they could sell it. That tunic had no seams. You know, some of the women must have really loved the Lord because they worked on this thing, and they didn't do it in pieces. You know, somebody sat there, and they just sewed this thing all the way around with the sleeves and the full body and the neck all in one piece. They had no seams, and so it caused them to cast lots because usually they would just tear it and divide it. It was kind of their pay you know, along with what they were getting paid by the Roman government. They could, you know, if they were crucifying somebody, they could take their personal possessions. So they wanted to see who could take it instead of dividing it up. The odds of anyone in history fulfilling that, fulfilling all of these, is, is it's something like 10 to the 14th power. That's 14 zeros. That's the odds. It's not going to happen. 
not going to happen unless the Lord who was and is and is to come declares it from the foundation of the world. The lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. And then the last of this prayer in this section, verse 19 says, But you, O Lord, do not be far from me, O my strength. Hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. And so now here another reference to the demonic plot going on around him. Verse 21, Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. And now really as we look at this psalm, we could say, and there's a pause right here. He says, you have answered me. And he begins to get in a whole different section of this psalm. Not, not looking at the cross, but looking at what comes from the cross. That first question, the question at the beginning of the psalm is now answered. You look, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You have answered me, and now we begin to see the answers. We have all the scriptures, so we have the benefit of knowing the gospel and the outpouring of the spirit with the beginning of the church. We have all that information for ourselves. And then the millennial reign of Christ on earth to come, we have it, but they didn't have that. They had this, but it references all those things. This was the answer to what would come from the life of Christ. This was the answer found in the Old Testament. Verse 22, he says, I will declare your name to my brethren. So speaking of the Jews who will receive the Messiah, in the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. So even though the cross brought death, his resurrection brought life. And now that is what he does in every part of his church body, right? In the midst of the assembly, just as we're doing here tonight. What did he say? You know, we're the Lord's body. This is his church, praising the Father. Exactly what he said would come from this descriptive death that David just wrote about. Verse 23, you who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and fear him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the afflicted of the afflicted, nor had the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard. In other words, everything that Jesus set out to accomplish was accomplished. When he said, it is finished to telestai, he wasn't saying, I'm done. I tap out. He was saying, it is accomplished, literally paid in full. It's paid. If you think that you have to add to it, forget it. What can you add to that? It's done. And don't take away from it. When a debt had been taken care of in that day, tetelestai, that word is what was written on the bill. Paid in full. That's the word Jesus used. That's what he wanted to be so clear. That second time that that sponge came up, he said, yeah, just enough so they can hear me. Just enough so everyone can hear me. Tetelestai. It's done. Paid in full. It's finished. Our sin put him there. Hebrews 12 reveals this about Jesus' thoughts on the cross. It says this, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher. Are you worried about getting there? He's the author and finisher. He wrote it out of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Notice that. It was a shameful thing to die that type of death. In the parable, I'm going to point something out to you. In the parable, you'll remember it where the man finds a treasure in the field. And Jesus gives us. And he sells all that he has to buy the field so he can gain the treasure, right? You guys remember that? Good. It's not a picture of us doing what it takes to get the treasure. It's a picture of the Lord doing what it took to gain the treasure. If that's the case, then what's the treasure? If the kingdom of heaven was what he pursued... And he was laying out what it would take for him to gain that treasure, then what's the treasure? Or should I say, who's the treasure? It's you. You're the treasure. The joy set before him that he endured the cross, it was you. You're the treasure. Verse 25, my praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. Eternal, abundant life for those who seek and praise him. 
now a reference to his thousand year reign on earth after the seven year tribulation. Verse 27, all the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. How does that sound? Eat and worship. I love it. Sounds like a good eternity. All those who go down to the dust shall bow down before him, even he who cannot keep himself alive. The, world tells, the word tells us this, that what? Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It doesn't matter if it's Osama bin Laden or Hitler or Karl Marx. Scripture tells us there will be a day where you will bow the knee. Or you. Every knee will bow. Some by choice in this life, some willingly, others by force in the next. Better to choose now. Verse 30, a posterity shall serve him. Posterity is literally seed or children. In other words, we could say the family of the Lord. It will be recounted of the Lord to the next generation. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has done this. After all the graphic, prophetic description of the crucifixion, David writes, they will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born, that he has done this. It's exactly what we're doing here tonight. He said, what will come from this descriptive death is the church, that they will declare what was done here. Exactly what we're doing, just as was prophesied. As we close, now I hope we're more in love with him day by day, right? That we're falling more in love with our Lord. He loves you. He loves you. And there's no higher way to show that than what he did. And the Father loves you. We're so familiar with the verse, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes on him will not perish, but have everlasting life. If you haven't done that, you can tonight. You can, by choice, bow the knee tonight. Much better way, much better way. If you're a whosoever, right? That's what it says there, whosoever. Well, you're a whosoever. So if you haven't done that, his arms are open for you. To those of us who already know him, the prophecies were declared a thousand years before the cross and 100% accurate. Let me ask this last question. The rest of the prophecies in this psalm, we saw all those. We saw how he had all those marks on the cross. Do you think that the rest of this psalm will be accurate? For sure. He nailed it all. He told us exactly how it was going to be. So when he says there's going to be a time where they declare this truth in the assembly, there's going to be a church. There's going to be a time where my kingdom rests on this world in peace and righteousness. It's the truth. It's going to happen. Let's pray. Father, we love you, Lord. Thank you so much for what you've done for us. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, that we didn't have to pay for our own sin. God, we understand, Lord, that your righteousness, Lord, your holiness, your purity, Lord, that your eyes cannot even look on sin. But Lord, Jesus, you became sin. And all we have to do is look to you in faith or to, to repent or to, to confess our sins, to ask you to forgive us and to receive you into our heart. Lord. If anyone here tonight, Lord, needs to know you, if they need this forgiveness, Father, if, if you've touched their heart by, by the picture of what you've done on the cross, Lord, send your spirit and call them to you now. The forgiveness is free. You've done it. Nothing to be added to it. Nothing taken away from it. Thank you so much, our King. Lord, we can't wait to be with you. Lord, we can't wait for you to come back. Lord, to take us out of here, to take us out of this mess. But Lord, until then, let us not forget what you've done for us. And let us, Lord, be busy about our Father's business. In Jesus' name, amen.